Good morning and welcome to another Tuesday tour. It's John Sauter along with Michael Fairchild behind the camera. And today we have Jack Sauter as our boom mic operator. Good to have you here, Jack. We have got a great show for you today as we talk about Purdue's flight simulators. So just to give you an idea of location, we've uh, come up Airport Road and we've crossed the tracks. And many of you are familiar with the Purdue Airport. We turned right. We came down several hundred yards to this beautiful new facility behind me that houses all, and I say all, of Purdue's flight simulators. So we want to talk about that today. Um, and to start off with, I want to try to give a little bit of a history that connects Purdue to our, our flight program. So I'm going to take you all the way back to 1903. The Wright brothers fly at Kitty Hawk and uh, talk about air flight being possible. And it's only eight years later, 1911, that uh, a, uh, an, uh, an, air, an aircraft similar to the Wright brothers actually lands on Stewart Field, uh, kind of between the Hall of Music and the Armory. And it's Purdue's first aviation day, 1911. And so that really plants the seed for aviation. The aviation program really starts out in the mechanical engineering school. Um, so that was President Stone at the time, actually, Shortly after that, some barnstormers came through, landed on that same field, and uh, President Stone wanted to go up in one of the planes. The trustees would not allow him to. It was much too dangerous. And so that's how the program basically kind of got started here. Uh, President Stone was followed by Pre uh, President Edward C. Elliott, uh, very reinforcing of the flight program and Purdue and getting the word out. In fact, he, along with R.B. Stewart and David Ross, who donated the, uh, the land, uh, built the Purdue Airport, uh, the first and one of the few still Purdue uh, airports owned by an, a university. And so uh, they built and opened this airport in 1934, and it was uh, instrumental in President Elliott convincing Amelia Earhart to come here in 1935. Amelia Earhart was here 1935 to 37, actually housed her plane down in Hangar 1, uh, the university, as you may be familiar, uh, uh, funded and outfitted uh, her Lockheed Electra twin-engine plane down there in Locker 1. In fact, we've got a great picture uh, of, of Amelia uh, along with President Elliott uh, and uh, George Putnam, who was the navigator on that flight, as they're here because they were practicing the flights. Uh, all happened down in Hangar 1. Again, brought great prominence to Purdue. Amelia was a great counselor uh, for women in careers and actually an instructor in some of the classes for the students in that particular uh, uh, major. And so the flight program, flight program was really starting to, uh, starting to, to, to gain some interest uh, around the country. Uh, that takes us to our next president, and that's uh, President Fred Hovde. Now we're into the 50s or so in the 50s. Purdue Airlines actually operated out of our Purdue Airport for, for a few years. Uh, but in 1955, uh, the Aviation Technology Department actually branched out, became their own department, and offered the first bachelor's degree in aviation technology, first in the country. And so in many respects, we've really been leading the country along the way. He was followed by President Hansen, Arthur Hansen, our eighth president. Uh, he took an interest, and not only did he take an interest, he actually got his pilot's license. He was the only president to actually fly um, uh, that we've had. Uh, so we've gone from President Stone, who they would not let fly, to President Hansen, who actually had his pilot's license and soloed here. So that grows, shows you kind of the progression of flight and how we've really been blessed to be a part of that along the way. President Hansen was followed by Steve Bering. Steve Bering, uh, who actually was, served in the Air Force, and so he had another interest, and he helped our fleet increase. Uh, he thought it'd be great to have a jet to fly to meetings, so he could actually fly to a meeting and be back in the office uh, that, that same day, uh, if need be. And it's just kind of increased since then. And so once we get into the 2000s, a lot of facilities, a lot of planes, and the need for flight simulators obviously uh, emerged. And uh, we are blessed to have this wonderful facility behind us. And so I want to start making our way down as we think about going into the building. Uh, and there's a memorial down here I want to talk about. But to do that, I'm going to invite in uh, Professor Jason Cutter into our, into our show. Good to have you here, Good Professor you, Cutter. Uh, how about that history? Was it pretty close? It was pretty close. And uh, you know what a lot of people don't re really 
understand is Purdue's been connected to aviation since virtually the beginning of the industry. Yes. Um, as you said, we've we've led collegiate aviation since the very beginning. University owned airport, Purdue Airlines, before we had a flight program even. Um, so we've we've always been at that forefront of, of aviation education here Excellent. at Purdue. And then behind you we have a memorial that I know is near and dear to you. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so this memorial that we're looking at here in front of the simulator building um, was erect, erected as a memorial to the, the students, uh, graduates, and faculty that have lost their lives uh, in the pursuit of their, their dreams of aviation. Um, specifically, we had one accident back in 1997 that took the lives of, of two students and one of our staff instructors. Uh, so it's, it, it's a constant reminder, memorial to, to their dreams and passions, and, and it also keeps us grounded in understanding the uh, implications of what we do here and the importance of what we do. A constant reminder of the, uh, uh, the importance and the consequence uh, yes. of the students who are graduates here. I think it, it, it causes everyone to serious up just a little bit, I suspect. Correct. Very much so. Okay. Well, now we want to go inside and actually have a look inside uh, the building. We'll see you on the inside. We're back inside the lobby of this wonderful building, uh, maxed up following Purdue protocol. And uh, we want to talk about this facility, and we'll start moving over to see uh, the namesakes for the building and talk a little bit about uh, really what, uh, what's available in the building. So, uh, Professor Cutter, why don't you tell us about the namesakes here? Okay. Well, it is the, the Holloman Nice Swanger Simulation Center. It was erected in 1999, uh, so just about 20 years old. Uh, the namesakes on the building, uh, Mr. Nyswanger is a 1968 graduate of our aviation program, went on to be a very successful businessman in the uh, transportation and logistics sector, uh, and it was through his generous gift that, uh, uh, that this building was possible. Uh, one of the faculty members that had a very profound effect on her impact on his career uh, was Professor Holloman. So uh, Professor Holloman, Charlie, as we refer to him around here, um, if you've been connected to Purdue Aviation at all over the last five or six decades, you've, you've been touched by the work that Charlie does. He was, he was a very prolific educator. He was nationally known, uh, very uh, you know, excellent pilot, very well connected in the industry. Uh, I've seen him do many things that are just outstanding. Like he's, the level of connectedness he kept with his students even after they graduated is, is unparalleled. So he is uh, very well known here has had a very deep impact on, on all of us. Um, the one thing I'd point out that's unique about this building is he was an active faculty member when, uh, when this building was dedicated, mm -hmm. which is, I, I believe it's the only building at Purdue and, and probably one of the few in academia in general um, that is, has been dedicated to a serving faculty member uh, because that just generally doesn't, doesn't happen. I think that's accurate and I can't imagine what you had to go through. <laughs> Yes. I, I suspect to get that done, but I, I suspect Scott Nicewander probably might have had something to do with that in terms of wanting his name attached to his name and the building. Yeah, he, he did, absolutely. And that, was, and that should show, uh, give you some indication of, of what a significant impact uh, Professor Holloman has made on this program, well, for sure. For him. Good for him. So. so we're in the building, and let's talk a little bit about, um, as I uh, uh, read the current literature, uh, there really is a need for pilots. Uh, and in fact, in the next few years, they're going to need a lot of pilots. And so we're going to be bringing a lot of students to Purdue. Um, our highly regarded program, I suspect, is pretty hard to get into. It has branched out into a variety of majors, mm -hmm. from maintenance programs to uh, uh, airport management programs and all those sorts of things. And uh, this building fits right into that. So could you talk about a little bit about the need for pilots and where it's all headed? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Prior to the pandemic, there were there were several reports published by industry groups that indicated that there could be a, a worldwide need of, of more than 700,000 pilots over wow. the next decade. Yeah. Um, now that has has taken a little bit of a hit with the pandemic, but we're already starting to see signs of recovery and airlines starting to hire again. So uh, we actually believe that, that that need for pilots is going to be even greater now because of the pandemic. Um, many people thought it would go the other way, but it's, it's not going to. Fewer people have started because of the pandemic, so that's only going to exacerbate the problem. 
Um, so you're right, all, all of our majors, including UAS, aviation management, professional flight, um, and even aeronautical engineering technology, at some point in their experiences do come through this building and use the technology here. So you're correct, it's not just the pilots, uh, but we're, we're training all of those leaders. And our, our mission in the professional flight program is uh, not necessarily to solve the quantity problem, the volume problem, um, but it is our mission to prepare the future leaders of the industry. So it's our, it's our goal to have uh, graduates at leadership positions in every airline uh, in the world. So that's our, that's our big idea and our grand, wow. grand challenge. So, and it's all because of the technology in this building um, that, that allows us to make those, okay. make those goals. And speaking of every airline in the world, um, that's big. And uh, so we've, which makes me think we've had astronauts come through this mm -hmm. program and there are airlines, there are corporate uh, airlines where they need pilots. There's all sorts of levels of Correct. need, I suspect. Yes. Yeah, we have graduates in, uh, in every level of the industry from flight instructor all the way up into the, the, the space program. Um, there certainly, we have Purdue graduates there as well and, and everything in between, every sector of the industry. And I suspect you might be a good example. I think you're a 98 grad, actually got in, out, did some pilot work and did some administration and don't you know, here you are Correct. since 2018 back uh, at Purdue. Yep, graduate of, 19, uh, graduate of the class of 1998 through the professional flight program. Uh, went out and flew uh, primarily corporate airplanes but also some airline experience domestically and internationally. Spent uh, about a decade at a training provider in the training, education and, and leadership and management sector uh, before completing my, my master's and PhD and then coming back here in 2018 as a faculty member. Excellent. Well, let's start walking towards the door we'll be going through. We're going to be going into the simulator room, what you've all been waiting for to see, and I can tell you it is impressive. So we'll see you just inside. We're now inside the flight simulator bay and uh, just surrounded by some significant uh, uh, training devices. Starting here as we work our way around behind us, um, Professor Cutter, tell, her, tell us what we see here. So we have a number of uh, different levels of technology in the building. That's one thing we've been very deliberate about over the past several years is building what we're referring to as the uh, technology pyramid to okay. adequately support um, our academic programs. And every device in this room has a specific place in that academic program. Okay. So, and we have different levels of technology beginning with uh, some, an example of our older technology, the device here my left um, up to oh, look at that. including the uh, newest acquisitions our full motion Hawker 900 XP simulator uh, or one of our three newest acquisitions uh, acquired from flight safety in uh, just a couple of years ago so it supports our third year coursework uh, very realistic level of simulations fully qualified by the FAA as a level D simulator so that does allow us to provide uh, training on, on how to fly that aircraft without actually going into the aircraft. And we're working on a number of advanced programs for our students um, to, to take advantage of that device. The, the other two newest devices are manufactured by MPS, which is Multi-Pilot Simulation, company over in uh, headquartered just outside of Amsterdam. Uh, they built two devices specifically for us. We've, we acquired them brand new over the last couple of years. Um, one represents the Airbus A320 aircraft, one represents the uh, Boeing 737. So the one we have behind us right here, or in front of us here, is uh, the Airbus aircraft. Very much like the full flight simulator, the only thing that these devices don't have that that one does is the motion base. So originally the motion in simulators was developed decades ago to give the pilots the feedback and feel of being in flight. Uh, visual technology has progressed to a state where we can do that with visual systems. We don't even need the, the, the motion anymore. So we're involved in a number of research projects. Uh, it's not just training our students, but we are a very active research agenda surrounding the flight simulation technology that we have. Uh, and certainly all these devices are part of that. And that's one thing we're looking at is the efficacy of fixed base training simulators. Um, the flight training devices are qualified by the FAA as level five, so that's just, again, one step, a couple steps below the full motion simulator. And again, the only thing it lacks is, is the motion base, so. Excellent, excellent. So, 
I'll ask you a couple of questions and I'm not sure I know exactly what I'm talking about here. But okay. So I assume on something like this, the instructor, the, the uh, instructor can, sim can ask them to deal with a, a fire in one of the engines and significant turbulence and things yep. you can't really do in a live plane, but you can simulate just about every emergency, I imagine, in one of these. Yes, uh, we, that, that is one of the distinct advantages of simulation is being able to put our students in those, those situations without uh, incurring the, the risk of doing it in an actual aircraft. The instructor stations, and in, in all of these devices, we can change the uh, weather conditions, uh, create a malfunction on any system in the aircraft. Um, they have upwards of three or four hundred different malfunctions that we can give the students, wow. ranging from very minor things to the more significant flight control uh, fire type yeah. issues. Okay. How about even the brakes going out on the plane? Oh, absolutely. That's one, <laughs> one of the things that we, we think practice. think about that, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, everything that's on the airplane, we can simulate a malfunction with it. Okay, excellent. So. Excellent. Well, we thought we'd actually go inside the simulator, kind of see where they're landing today, just to kind of give you a feel of the visual uh, of what it looks like on the inside. We're going to hop up a few steps, and we'll see you inside. We're inside the simulator, and uh, Professor Cutter, tell us what's going on here. <laughs> Well, we're in the uh, A320, the Airbus A320 flight training device. Uh, we have two of our uh, seniors, graduating seniors in professional flight at the controls, Colleen in the left seat and Caleb in the right seat. Looks like they're on the final approach into uh, JFK in, in New York City. JFK. So, yep. So how many, uh, how many different uh, uh, runways, different airports can you call up? Uh, we have several dozen uh, major okay. airports, yeah. Okay, excellent. And today looks like a, uh, a clear day to fly. Good day to fly to give you a sense of what the visuals look like. Okay. But again, uh, we can change time of day, weather conditions, at the touch of a button. Excellent. Excellent. And so here we are in New York. Who would have thought? And uh, looks like we're going to touch down. And we're there, by golly, I'll tell you. Smooth landing, wasn't it? Smooth landing. Um, Michael even asked a little bit earlier about motion sickness, and it, it's, it's possible, we can tell you. This is a <laughs> real simulation here. So. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, even, even experienced professional pilots, um, because of the way we simulate motion in the simulator, I've, I've had experienced professional pilots get motion sick in the simulator during training sessions. Interesting. Interesting. So. All right. Students, thank you very much. We appreciate it. All right, good luck. We're gonna go back out and look at some more simulators. Uh, we're back into the room on the other end of the motion simulator. Is it fairly unique to have something this sophisticated on a college campus? Uh, yes, there are very few collegiate programs that have this level of, of simulation. We're, we're certainly on the top, uh, uh, top tier in that regard. Excellent, excellent. And I know over the years we've gotten donations from a variety of airlines also, the actual planes themselves? Yep, we've uh, had a, uh, several donations of aircraft uh, from a number of different companies and airlines. Typically those aircraft don't fly, they're used by our maintenance students as maintenance trainers. Yeah. Uh, we've also had some simulator donations as well from various organizations, um, such as some of the airlines and NASA. Uh, and then, uh, that has been over the past several decades and then up to today, uh, we've acquired the devices that we have here as a school. Okay. How many total devices do we have here? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I honestly don't even know the number. Um, <laughs> we have, uh, starting at the top, we have the one full motion simulator. We have the two devices like we were just in, the Airbus and the Boeing. We have uh, this Redbird crosswind trainer that helps students practice uh, crosswind landings. We have two uh, smaller devices that sit up on the corner there of our of our uh, atrium and those simulate our newest uh, training fleet the Piper Archers that we took delivery of last summer and then we have three flight training devices that uh, replicate the the Cirrus fleet that just left and then we have one device from Frasca down on the end that is um, a reconfigurable training device so it can simulate wow. several different types of aircraft so Whatever that adds up to, probably a dozen. 
So uh, we, our students are coming out of here job ready, ready to go into the industry and, and make their mark. And I imagine they're highly sought after too. Uh, they are, absolutely. We're working with a number of different partners around the industry and uh, we, our graduates have a very, um, a very well laid career path in front of them. Um, uh, the Purdue pedigree is going to serve them well. Excellent. Professor Cutter, we thank you so much for sharing your time um, and your facilities and having your students, uh, having them do things for it. Uh, very exciting to be out here with these uh, particular devices and the facility and the students. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of uh, Tuesday Tour. Hail Purdue.